Hey y'all, welcome back to Spirit of the Outdoors, another episode of Just In Time. I want to talk to you today on the topic of sacrifice. We know that sacrifice was important in the very beginning through the Old Testament. We know that sacrifice is not technically mentioned until Jacob started making sacrifices. It was called sacrifice. But before that, it was considered offering, and Jacob did this in the mid part of Genesis. I can't remember exactly which chapter, uh, but I have been reading through a lot about sacrifice today in preparation for this because it is a very important thing. And a lot of people have the mentality now that where well, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, and he was. But, that, you know, now I don't have to do anything, but that is far from the truth, actually, uh, because the Lord said, I am God and I change not. So his mentality and his needing an offering from his people really has not changed. It's just that the method changed a lot. So I want to start and I want to read and I want to try to do more teaching today than I do necessarily preaching like I do sometimes. And it's more teaching on this channel than it is preaching, but sometimes we get a little into both of it. So I wrote some notes. I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 through 8, the story of Cain and Abel. Let me put my glasses on before I ever start because I'm getting older. My eyes are going bad. Genesis 4 and 3 says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and of his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not also be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass that they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Now, we know that Cain killed Abel. That is no great mystery. But what I want to point out about Cain killing Abel is that God was not pleased with his offering, and he was pleased with Abel's offering. Abel offered the firstlings of his flock, the firstborn, the best, the choice. The best that he had is what he gave to God. And of the fruit of the ground is what Cain was bringing. And it was just a multiplied abundance, so he just brought some of it. It wasn't the best. It wasn't the first. It wasn't... So what I want to point out is there is an offering you can give to God that he's not pleased with. And most people have the mentality that, well, anything you give to God, God's okay with. God's happy. You know God wants your best. That's what I want to point out today. Now let's go to Leviticus chapter 1. If I can find it. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 1 says, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. And say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock, and his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd. Let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. 
He's got to willingly want to give to God. It can't be forced. It can't be out of obligation. It can't be because he knows that's what he's got to do. He's got to willingly bring it. He can't be made to bring it. The firstlings, the best, the choice, the firstborn, the first you receive, the best you have could possibly be all that you have. You don't never know. You give the first you've got, and then you ask God to bless and give you more in return. There was a method to it. There was an order to it. God said, this is what I want. It's got to be accepted, and this is for atonement. This is to pay for your sins. Now, we know now that we don't make a blood sacrifice out of animals to roll our sins ahead for one year. In this day and age, it was done every time, every year. You made a sacrifice, and that rolled your sins up a year. Next year at this appointed time, you had to make another sacrifice for a year's worth of life. So this is a routine done. There was a lot of animals died. There was a lot of death. There was a lot of blood over the years for all these people. But there came a time in life where God decided, I want a more personal relationship. I want something more intimate with man. I want a conversation. I don't want just a one year, once a year, you come to me and make this offering. I, I, I need a living sacrifice. And we know that God came down, robed himself in flesh, died on a cross, paid the ultimate sacrifice in blood. We no longer have to do that. And a lot of people get the mentality, well, you know, God took care of everything. Now I don't have to do nothing. Well, that, that is not how I see it. As I read this, the part of people talk about a relationship with God. Part of having a relationship with God is understanding the mind of God and knowing what God wants. Like I said, he said, I am God and I change not. His attitude hasn't changed. He has adjusted the methods, but what he desires from man has not changed. His desire to commune with man, when he first created man, he wanted somebody to talk to. He wanted a relationship, somebody to come down and spend some time with. And that has not changed. And the fact that he said, I want somebody to willingly want to give to me. And I'll give back to them. But I want to know that they willingly want to offer me sacrifice. That they, that they want It's got to cost them something. So what does it cost and what is it now? I'm going to go to the book of Romans chapter 12. And at this point of life, it gets uncomfortable for a lot of people. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We go down through some teachings about the body and through Corinthians, there's a lot of teachings throughout the letters in the New Testament. There's a lot of teachings about the body. Things that is a shame, things that is frowned upon, things that God just don't want. It don't really line any of these things out to say, you're going to hell if you don't do this. And that's what people want to hear. People want to know nowadays, okay, what all can I get away with? That's their mentality. In my body, what all can I do with this body and not go to hell over it? Because I'm going to do everything that the Bible don't just say is a sin. But I come to you today and I say, if you love God, and you know that, you know, well, this, I may not put you in hell over this, but I really don't like it, then I'm not going to do it. I may slip up and do it. I may make a mistake and do it. But I'm not going to just say, well, it don't matter what God thinks. I'm, I'm going to do it because he didn't say I was going to hell over it, so I'm going to do it anyway. And a lot of it has to do with pride. 
self-identity. Being confident in knowing that I am blood-bought and I am now property of Jesus Christ. Jesus looked at every disciple and he said, take up your cross and follow me. Sell everything you've got, follow me. Follow me. And Jesus nailed himself literally or was allowed himself to be nailed to a cross physically. But he said, follow me. And that was a type and shadow of what we do because now we are the body of Christ. We talked about this last week. And us being the body of Christ, we've got to be holy. He said, be ye holy. You be holy, in other words, because I'm holy. And I'm going to be living in you, and I'm not living in a trash dump. I'm going to live inside your body, and I'm going to work through you, and I don't want it to be full of garbage. I don't want it to look God-awful. I don't want it to be pride and adorned with all this costly stuff. He talked about costly array and gluttony. Two of the things that even the most extreme Pentecostal overlook. And I am affiliated with the Pentecostal, so I can talk about it. Even them don't get up in a pulpit and preach against gluttony, which is eating too much. We eat out of pleasure, and we should not. We wear costly array, and we should not. Now, I'm not talking about, hey, you need to dress poor and look poor and go wear poor clothes. No, you can wear nice clothes. You can wear expensive clothes. It is the attitude, and well, look at this name brand I have because I'm somebody and I wear the best that there is. That is a terrible attitude to have. And I think costly array fits the vehicle you drive across the board. If you go buy a vehicle because this is a name brand, this is, look at the wheels that's on this, look at all the chrome, look at how nice my vehicle, this says that I am somebody, when I ride around in this vehicle, then you ain't got no business with it. And that trickles all down through everything that pertains to this body, the way we carry it, the things we do to it. This body, it says, know you not that your body is a temple. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. It is the house of the Holy Spirit. And some people wonder, well, why ain't the Holy Spirit working through me like it does some people? Probably because you have defiled the house into the point that the Holy Spirit don't want to reside in it. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. We looked at Cain and Abel. They were some sacrifices that weren't acceptable. People say, oh, well, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I believe on Jesus. But Cain and Abel both give sacrifices, but Cain's was not, did not please God. God was not happy with it. He said, yours is going to lead to sin. He said, if you do well, he said, you'll have respect too. But he was in a sense telling him, I don't have respect for the offering that you have given me. And some people have presented a body to Jesus Christ today that is not acceptable, that he is not pleased with, that is not respected because they don't really care. People say, oh, this is my body, my choice. No, it's not your body. When you nailed it to a cross, when you took up your cross and said, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, I'm going to give my life to Christ, you give your body to him as well. That is your life. Your body is one of your most prized possessions. And you must offer it to God and say, God, what would you ask of me? God, what, what do you want me to do? Not, not what, am I, what can I get away with, but what do you ask of me? How do you want me to dress? How do you want me to carry myself? What attitude do you want me to have with other people? Because this holiness thing is inside and outside. When people look at you, you represent Jesus Christ. When you tell somebody, I'm a Christian and I, I believe in Jesus and I want you to come to church with me and you start trying to witness to people and they look at you, the first thing they see is the outside of your body. And if it looks a mess... They don't want it. If it looks like, well, I think more highly of myself than I should, I'm prideful and I'm a... They probably don't want it. Be well-dressed, take care of yourself, look good, but be humble. The next thing is, 
is what kind of attitude did you start with? Did, did, did they just see you while ago out there cussing somebody out or, or mistreating somebody or, you know? This kind of stuff is an outward expression of what's inside of you. Whatever's on the inside's going to come out. But the first thing people see is the appearance. Does it look holy? Does it look godly? You say, oh, well, I don't see nothing wrong with this. But just because you don't see nothing wrong with it don't mean God didn't see nothing wrong with it. You see, we have gotten really comfortable with a lot of things because we look at the people around us. And we say, well, I'm doing better than they are. The Bible says that a fool compares himself among himself. In other words, if, if I justify what I'm doing because there's people over here that's doing worse, I am a fool. I need to compare myself to the New Testament, to what this Word of God says. I need to read through the Corinthians. I need to read through Romans. I need to read through Hebrews. I need to read through all of these letters that Paul wrote, that John wrote, that Peter wrote, all these apostles wrote. And I need to apply every bit of it to my life. And I need to shape my life and my body and my attitude around this anvil. Not try to bend it and pick, choose through it to fit what I like and what feels good. And I know there's some stuff been taught from birth. That I read through this Bible and I can't find it in there. And then I read through and I find stuff that I have never heard nobody preach. As I already said, I don't hear very many preachers preach on gluttony. But if eating is your hobby and you just eat, it's no different than anything else out there that's wrong. I hear a lot of people harp on tattoos. I've got one. I don't find a lot of scripture in the Bible about tattoos. But I would say this, if you're putting defiled-looking stuff on your body, why? You know, I'm not going to say, hey, a tattoo's going to send you to hell. I got one. I've had it a long time. I don't want no more. I'm not going to say somebody's going to hell over one. But I would be very careful in the things I do to this body because is this going to bring glory to God? Or is it to bring glory to me? You say, oh, well, that's no different than putting on a nice shirt. It's just art. It's just to look good. Is it? Because we've talked about costly array, which is expensive, extravagant clothes. And I'm throwing this at the preachers that stand in a pulpit that's got to buy a three, four, five thousand dollar suit to stand on stage. That is costly array. It is not necessary. Should you have a nice suit? Should you wear your best to church? Absolutely. But my problem with preachers wearing three, four, five thousand dollar suits is if you can afford this personally, this excess and expense, is there people in your audience that's struggling to pay their light bill? I think that money could have been better spent in a more pleasing and acceptable way to God. That God got more glory out of it than he is with you having a three or $4,000 suit on. So you see where this becomes a problem. You see where it's not just about, okay, well, wearing expensive clothes is wrong. No, it's the attitude that goes into it. It's the mentality that is attached to it. You preach against gluttony. And I can go sit down and gorge myself until it's unhealthy. And we know today that our food that we eat is more unhealthy than it has ever been in the history of the world, especially here in America. But we'll frown on the drug addict because what he's doing is a sin. And I personally can't see a big difference in it because both of them are destroying this temple, this holy, acceptable sacrifice that I am presenting to God. And I'm not come here today to say you're going to hell over this, 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 or this. I'm not never going to get on this and tell you how to dress, tell you what to wear, what to look like. But I'm going to help you to think more deeply and understand the reason 
that somebody does something. Because I'm going to promise you, when you look at people in the world that are doing more extreme measures than you are, they didn't mostly do it because, well, it feels good and I like to do it. No, they're doing it out of sacrifice to God. They're saying, God, I, I'm not sure if this is important or not, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'd rather be safe than sorry. My grandpa used to say, son, he said, I'd rather have too much corn in the crib during the winter than to not have enough. It's better when winter's over. There's some corn left to be thrown out to be fed to the chickens and fed to the animals than it is to get halfway through winter and realize, you know what? We didn't grow enough this year. We didn't put up enough because then it's too late. I've mentioned it over and over about the ten virgins and there was five wise and five foolish and the five wise had extra oil and they made it in. The five foolish just barely had enough to get by. They, their lamps was burning. They were there at the right place at the right time. But the lamps started getting dim at the end. And what I'm going to tell you, my friend, is we're getting to where the bridegroom's coming. We're close. And the pressure's going to be on. And if you can fall, you will fall. If you can be tempted, you will be tempted. The pressure's going to be amped up. And it's important that I've got plenty extra stored up in my soul. That when the pressure's on, I'm real confident in what I believe and what I know. I watch a lot of people today that are getting weak in faith and, and, and things that they once believed, they no longer believe. And the Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. Whereby this guy over here that has never been taught, has never been explained this, quite possibly might get away with less because he don't know. But it's my job as a man of God to sit here today and to try to help you to know. And you can't do any of this because me or any other preacher says you got to do this. You got to dress like this and you got to act like this and you got to walk like this. No, you need to open this book up and you need to read it with open eyes and a humble heart and pray, God, open my eyes that I can see and you speak to me what you want me to do in my life and how you want me to live and present myself. Because, God, if I'm not doing enough, and this is my honest-to-God prayer today, God, if I'm not doing enough, show me. I want, I've got one shot at this, Lord, and I want to please you. When you look down at this old country boy down here in the Red Hills of Mississippi, I want you to smile and say, that old boy's doing the best he can do. With what he's got to work with, he's doing the best he can. And that's all a man can ask for. And if God will convict my heart over something, I'll lay it aside. I don't care what it is. I have laid down things I loved before. I can do it again. And I'll give you a couple examples. I used to love Alabama football. In fact, the tattoo that I have on my chest is an Alabama A right here. But I noticed that there was times it wasn't that I got mad when we lost a game. Losing didn't bother me. It's just a game. But it was the people that want to go to mouthing off and talking. And I would get angry at them because most of them wouldn't even for the other team. They was just somebody that just didn't like us. And that got to bother me. I said, you know what? This ain't worth it. This is causing hardship amongst friends. I've watched friends fall out. I've watched friends fight. I, it, no. I said, you know what? I'm done with all this. Not to mention it really looks like more worship and excitement goes into a football game than it does to church. Lay it aside. If it's on, I'll watch it today. If I hear about it, I pull for Alabama. But I don't lay aside time out of my day today. I don't carve out time out of my Saturday anymore to sit down and watch football. I carve out time out of my Saturday to film just-in-time videos. 
because that is holy and acceptable. And that's what God has put in me. It's what God impresses in my heart to do. I read a Facebook post this past week. A guy had a picture of a girl with tattoos and earrings and different colored hair and dressed inappropriately. And she's sitting on a church pew and they were... The post was implying that the church people shamed her and, and, and pushed her away because of how she looked. My comment was this. I have never been a part of a church that truly felt like if somebody like that walked in that they didn't want them there. I have never been a part of a church like that. And I'm proud of that fact. Every time I have ever seen somebody like that walk into church doors, they were loved on, they were welcomed, they were told that they was glad they were there. What is actually happening to these people is they walk into a place and they feel conviction in their heart from God Almighty. And the only way they can understand it is they feel like, well, these people don't want me here. I don't feel welcome here. It wasn't that they weren't welcome. It's that they felt conviction and ran from it instead of humbling themselves to that conviction because it's a real thing and you'll really feel it and you'll feel real guilty about something. That is what conviction is. Obey it. Listen to it. I have took up enough of your time today, y'all. I thank you for watching Just In Time, and I pray that God will speak through me to you to help you to understand this awesome Word of God. And I'm not so smart that I understand all of it, but God opens my eyes, and He speaks to me to minister what I feel in my heart about this book, and He helps me to understand it. And that comes through the Spirit that liveth in me. And I want to do the best that I can to help you to understand. Eunuch said, how can I understand except I have a man to explain it to me? And Philip explained it and the eunuch was baptized. And that's what I want to do for you today. I love y'all. I'm praying for you. Remember, if you'll do a little better today than you did yesterday, tomorrow will be a better day. God bless all of you. I love you. We'll see you next time.